All right, good morning. <clears throat> uh, we may have some people coming in, but I think let's get started. Uh, since we have a lot to go through today, uh, here's the plan. The theme is, um, well, we have three different themes, recommenders, embeddings, and matrix factorization, which is sort of um, three models that have a lot to do with each other that are slightly sort of three different perspectives on the same thing. Uh, so this is the plan. We'll start with the setting of recommender systems. which is uh, kind of like an abstract task, like classification or um, regression. And we'll look at matrix factorization, which is sort of the most popular way to uh, attack this problem or to think about models that uh, attack this problem. So we'll look at matrix factorization first, mostly in the context of, of recommender systems, even though it's a more general method. And after the break, we'll see where matrix factorization uh, crops up as a sort of perspective on other methods. So first, we'll have a quick look back at PCA, which we already discussed in the fourth lecture. But we'll look back at it um, not as much as I planned. I couldn't quite fit it in, so it'll just be a, a sort of Brief look back at PCA now viewed as a matrix factorization method. We'll look a little bit at graph models, which is a um, popular uh, new field these days because graphs are a very good um, data structure for modeling ma various things. Uh, this will be pretty high level, the graph models. We don't have a lot of time to go into it deep. There will be master courses that uh, dig into this deeper. Uh, and then we'll look a little bit at validation. So this old question that we've seen a couple of times before. In this slightly different setting where we don't have necessarily independent samples, how do we break up our data into a test set, a training set, and a validation set? Which for all of these uh, models we will discuss today is, uh, is an important question. So that's the plan today. I will start with recommender systems. The main, I will follow this paper as a sort of through line. So most of what you'll see today will come from this paper, which is pretty readable. So if you're looking into recommender systems, if you want to use it for anything, either for your machine learning project or for your bachelor thesis, I recommend reading this paper. Um, and this paper, you can see it here, it says the Netflix Prize. Uh, this is sort of the culmination of a long research project uh, across multiple universities that started in, let me see if I have it here, in 2006. <coughs> when Netflix, which was then mainly a, a DVD rental company where you could order uh, DVDs through the post, you could watch them and then send them back. Um, they wanted to recommend movies to people. They had a big database of movies, too much to show all the movies to one user uh, in one go, so they wanted to recommend to people movies that they might like. They had a basic like system, uh, and they wanted to basically improve the system that they had at that point. So they created a prize, the Netflix prize, where they made a lot of their data. They lightly anonymized it. There's some criticism there for not properly anonymizing it. Um, they lightly anonymized their data. They made it available to researchers, and they said, if you can improve the uh, predicted ratings, so the, uh, we with, they withheld some ratings from, by some users, if you can uh, predict those ratings more accurately than our current baseline by if I have it here, the root mean squared error by 10% from the current model, uh, then we'll give you a million dollars. So that was sort of uh, an incentive to the community to start solving this problem. And it worked very well, because it became a very active topic of research, um, which led to basically the, the research topic of, of recommender systems. So, um, We'll look at it mostly in the, the sort of Netflix context, 
but it does generalize. So here's um, here's what it looks like on Netflix, or looked like. This might be an old screenshot. I don't know. The ratings are a little bit less prominent these days. Uh, but basically, if you're a Netflix user, you get this. Uh, hold on. You get this button, this thumbs up, thumbs down button, where you can indicate whether or not you like a movie. And the idea is that if you do that for a bunch of movies, then Netflix learns what kind of movies you like, and they can predict which movies you might also like. And they will show. Uh, they will use that every there, everywhere in their interface. In the movies they show you in general, the movies they specifically recommend to you, etc. And uh, also how they rank the search results if you search for something specific. Um, and that's called explicit feedback. So you explicitly ask a user, do you like this thing or do you not like this thing? And then you give them a thumbs up, a thumbs down, you give them a five star rating, uh, maybe just a thumbs up, just a single like button like Facebook has, uh, and Twitter also. Uh, all of that works, but you basically ask explicitly so you can also you get very nice clean data that you can trust. You can really say, if the user presses this button, you can be really sure that they meant to say, to indicate to you that they like this or didn't like it. Um, of course, that doesn't always work. Users don't always press the button. It's sort of requiring a user to take some action. Uh, so you'll get very sp sparse feedback here. It's good feedback, but sparse feedback. You, don't, uh, you can't get this for all users in all movies. Uh, so you can enrich this with some extra information, which is what's called implicit feedback, where you basically take a look at something else that is cheaper to, uh, uh, another source of data that is cheaper to acquire, but uh, less indicative that somebody, it's, it's less clear that it actually means that the user likes it, but it might still be a good proxy for a like. So if you look at, for instance, at page views, you can see when a, Twitter, uh, a Netflix user looks at a particular movie, Sometimes that means they like it, sometimes it means they don't. But in general, you can sort of infer that there's at least some interest. So it means something. It's some source of information that you can help hopefully uh, work into your algorithm as well. Uh, you can give users the option to create a wish list, which is very popular in these frameworks, in these, these um, online systems. Uh, so um, Netflix has a watch list, the movies that you intend to watch. Amazon has wish lists, things that you intend to buy or you would like other people to buy for you. Uh, that sort of thing. So it's a simple feature to add and it gives you a lot of information about uh, links between users and items. You can record cursor movements even. So this does happen a lot. Uh, you can do it for, it's a little bit expensive and it slows down your website a little bit if it's a website, but uh, a lot of websites do do this for some percentage of their uh, of their users. So if you sort of hover over an item and then decide not to click it, there's a good likelihood that Amazon or Netflix or whoever still knows that you're linked to that item. Uh, so that's called implicit feedback. Then there's site information, which is sort of the, the role in this setting that normal feature, uh, features in the classical machine learning setting take. So even if you don't know anything about a movie, if nobody's liked a movie and nobody has given any implicit feedback on a movie, you can still say, well, this movie was directed by the same director as this other movie, and a lot of people like that movie, so maybe we can link the two and say, oh, if you like this movie, it's by the same director uh, and the same like users. Like this is a, uh, You liked a lot of Dutch movies, you probably speak Dutch, so we can actually recommend you this Dutch movie, even though the likes don't show a direct link. So ultimately, we would like to include site information as well. And in many settings, we want to put all these things together and give people recommendations, or at least predict associations between users and items. Uh, it's not just about recommending media, recommending movies. It uh, crops up, this setting crops up in a lot of places. So Amazon, I mentioned it earlier already, also has users and items. They were probably the first to do this. Uh, so Netflix sort of popularized it, but uh, Amazon probably was the first to have a, a, a large scale recommendation system rolled out where they said, these are also things you might like to buy. Uh, and you can, yeah, just uh, look at your users and the items they bought 
use your implicit feedback, your explicit feedback. Here you have a lot of implicit feedback in what people bought, but maybe that's even explicit. Uh, although it doesn't necessarily imply that they liked it, but they're certainly associated. Um, in other settings, it's slightly uh, slightly more far away from the um, the sort of Netflix setting of users and items and, and people consuming or purchasing things. So if you want to recommend news stories to people, uh, this is quite an old screenshot, I guess, because Jon Stewart's still hosting the Daily Show. Uh, but you can recommend news stories as well in this same way to people. So you have users, you have users again, and items which are uh, news stories. Um, and these days, a lot of websites like these big three. Basically, the whole navigation of the website is driven by these recommender systems. Uh, so if you go to YouTube, if you go to Twitter, and I guess they, I don't have Facebook myself, but I think Facebook does something similar. Basically, everything you see from the first time you open the website is ranked by a recommender system. Uh, they all have these big algorithms that decide what, decide what you might like, and out of all the content that they have for you, either tweets or videos or general web content, they show you ranked by how much they think you like it. Which is, in fact, getting to the point where it's uh, sort of now slightly controversial. There are things like filter bubbles, so people are worrying that uh, people are only seeing content from a certain source, that these algorithms, especially the YouTube algorithms, are over-optimized for user engagement. What you see, for instance, is that uh, slightly more radical content in either direction of the political spectrum leads to more user engagement. So if you blindly optimize for user engagement or for uh, a length of video views, what you see is that more radical uh, videos are getting recommended more. Uh, and this is now being rolled out at such a scale that this is basically part of the infrastructure of our society. It's now the decisions made in these uh, algorithms are really affecting uh, the way our society operates. So that's quite interesting, but it also means that we need to be a little bit more responsible with these kinds of algorithms, and we need to know exactly how they work and how to interpret them. So a little bit more about this setting, basically. So we, uh, the, the setting applies, the recommender system setting applies to any problem where we have uh, subjects and objects, both of which are a large set of either items, like news stories, uh, movies, uh, users, and we have associations between the two, which we can express like a has-property relation. So you can say, well, uh, a user li uh, liked a movie, that's one setting, but it doesn't always have to be a user, so you can, for instance, if you have a, a, a data set of a lot of recipes and ingredients, and you want to predict which recipe might be good in which ingredient. Uh, there's no users involved there, but it still doesn't fit the classical machine learning setting because you don't really have instances and features. You have two sets of, uh, two sort of two instance spaces, and the only data you have is relations between those two. Um, and that's sort of when you start looking at this recommender system or matrix factorization setting. Uh, it's another good example is like if you have um, data from, for instance, the European Parliament, uh, there's lots of open data available for who voted for which law. Uh, you can download that and you can model that as well, like uh, predicting which politician will vote for which law or is likely to have voted for which law based on which other politicians have voted for them. Uh, and sometimes even the object and the subject are from the same family. So you see this a lot in social networks, for instance, if you want to model friend-off relations or all these other social relations. Uh, the uh, sets on the two sides have the same, they're the same sets. So we have uh, uh, people, users on both sides. That's also possible. For now, though, we uh, to keep things uh, sort of a little bit more concrete, we will talk in terms of users and movies for the rest of the lecture. Uh, just bear in mind, in the back of your mind, that it really extends to a broad range of settings. Uh, so the abstract task, uh, 
that we are faced with, given a bunch of users and a bunch of movies, given an incomplete set of explicit ratings, so we don't know for all movies and users what the rating would be. If we did, we, didn't need to we wouldn't need to recommend anything. So for a sort of random sample of, uh, a non-uniform random sample of user movie pairs, we have some ratings. We have possibly some implicit ratings or implicit uh, feedback. We have side information, which may also be incomplete. So uh, features for all movies and features for all users. And given all this information, we want to predict how user U uh, would rate item M which we can compare to the true rating and we want to minimize some loss function over that. So there it sort of starts to look like normal machine learning again. And to start with, we will uh, forget about the implicit information and the side information and we will look just at the ratings. Because the um, assumption here, usually in these kinds of systems, is that the explicit feedback is the most valuable source of information. That's where most of our good predictions are going to come from. And the other stuff is just... Uh, to uh, boost things a little bit and deal with edge cases, but uh, most of the important information comes from the explicit, inf uh, explicit feedback. So we can visualize that, uh, conceptualize that as a matrix, where we put all the users on one side, so it's a big matrix, and all the, so we put all the users vertically and all the movies horizontally. So for one particular combination of one user and one movie, if we have a rating, we put the rating in that point in the matrix. And for now, we will assume that ratings are on uh, are real values that can be both negative and positive. So they're somewhere on a scale between minus infinity and positive infinity. And we'll assume that we have dislikes as well as likes. So we have negative ratings as well as positive ratings. Yes, yes. So uh, explicit information, explicit feedback is what the user gives by clicking a button. For, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. When you, sorry, what, what happened? No, no, so if you hold your cursor over an item but don't click it, that's very, that's implicit feedback. So we do, we'll deal with that later. For now, this is explicit feedback. So these users have explicitly told us, I like this movie or I dislike this movie. But most of this matrix is still empty. Most of this matrix, we don't know the, uh, the value. So the problem here is that we have these movies and we want to, uh, movies and users and we want to make some, draw some conclusions about them. But we don't know anything. Our only representation of the user is this row in the matrix. Our only representation of the, co the movie is this column in the matrix. Uh, so we've seen this information. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good question. So yeah, um, you might not, if you're a, a company, you might want to boost certain products, uh, even though nobody likes them, you still want people to watch them, which does sometimes happen, happen on Netflix. Um, we'll talk about that later. For now, we'll just uh, assume that this, uh, the company's playing fair and uh, none of the movies get special uh, treatment. Um, so we don't know anything about the users in the movies. They're a big set of sort of atomic objects. We know sort of only, the only thing we know is when a movie is uh, that movies are different from each other, um, and we don't have any uh, information about it beyond these likes. So we've seen that before in the uh, sequence lecture, where we talked for the first time about embedding models, which is sort of the, the thing we use when we have a, a big bag of discrete items that we don't have any other information about. And what we do in embedding models is we look at these objects, that we don't know anything about, and we model them by assigning an embedding vector EX to object X. And EX is just a vector of real values for which we are going to learn the content. So we will assume that EX represents the object X. We will assume that two objects are similar 
for some definition of what similar means. Uh, if their embedding vectors are similar, for some similarity function over vectors. And then using those assumptions, we will feed these vectors into some, we will do some computation with them, which will lead us through a loss, which we can then minimize. So then we will uh, learn the values of these embedding vectors to minimize the loss. And that's what we're going to do here as well. So step one is to set up these embedding vectors. So we make a big matrix for the users and a big matrix for the movies. And every column in the user matrix is, represents a user. And every column in the movie matrix represents a movie. Note that we have different numbers of columns because we have a different number, presumably a different number of users from an, the number of movies. And we choose an embedding dimension, which is just the number of numbers that we use to represent a user and that represent a movie. That's a hyperparameter. We have to tune that. But uh, the embedding dimensions are the same. So the movies and the users are represented by vectors of the same length. Because we are going to compare these two vectors, the user vector and the movie vector, to give us a score. And the score, the higher the score is, the more likely we will consider it that the uh, user likes the movie. If the score is high, the user likes the movie. If the score is low, the user dislikes the movie. Uh, and you can come up with lots of score functions, but basically this is the sort of standard approach and the mo uh, one of the most effective ones, which is to take the dot product between the two vectors. And the way to think about this is if you imagine that we don't learn these embedding vectors for a second, so I imagine that we have infinite time and infinite patience, and we decide to fill in all these values ourselves. So we turn these into manual features that we're just going to annotate ourselves. What we might do is make each feature mean something about the user and mean something about the movie. For instance, we might annotate by uh, genre, so we can annotate the movies by how much romance there is in them, how much action there is in them, and how much comedy there is in them. And then we can annotate the users by the corresponding features. So uh, we give the users the features like how much comedy, the, how much they like comedy, how much they like action, and how much they like romance. And if you take the dot product between these two vectors, what you see is that um, if the two features match, so a user likes romance a lot, and a user likes, uh, and a movie has lots of romance, then that the corresponding term becomes very high, which adds to the score, which means it's more likely that the user likes a movie. Uh, if both are negative, so the user dislikes romantic movies a lot, and the movie has a negative amount of romance, so it's a very bleak movie maybe, uh, then the negatives cancel out, and the term also becomes very high. So again, as you would expect, that also increases the score. Whereas if they're mismatched, then we get a, a, a negative that doesn't cancel out, so the term becomes very high as well, if the values are high, but it becomes negative, so it detracts from the score. So if we have a user that hates romance and a movie that contains lots of romance, then the score goes down. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, so the question is, uh, are these values bounded? No, these are uh, unbounded values. So that brings, sort of brings me to my next point. Uh, so these values can be very large or very small, which also gives an indication. So if a user is completely ambivalent about roman romance, we can set their, their likes romance feature to zero, and then the term disappears. If a user has very strong feelings, very, very much likes romance, then we set the uh, value to very big, and then this term becomes sort of uh, weighs much more than the other terms. Same as with the uh, movies. So if a movie has lots and lots and lots of romance, the value becomes very big. We set the value very big, then the term becomes very important. And if it has just a bit of romance, but not enough that most people would mind, then we set the value very small, 
and then the term becomes uh, relatively unimportant. So in that sense, the, uh, it's not just the sign of the value here in these vectors that matters, but also the magnitude. It also tells us something. So practically, we don't have time to set this by hand. Uh, oh, yeah, the question? Uh, both. So the question is, can it be zero, can it be negative? Yes, if it's zero, that sort of indicates that the user doesn't care about romance. So then the term disappears from the sum. Uh, if it's negative, then it sort of indicates that the user hates romance. Uh, so we need a, a movie with sort of anti-romance, an anti-romantic movie, in order to please that user to make that term big. In practice, however, we don't have the time and the patience to do this for all users and all movies. Uh, if we did, then we wouldn't need to learn anything. We could just compute these scores. Uh, in practice, we don't have the time and the patience to do this, and we're not entirely sure that we could even do it accurately. So what we do instead is we learn this. So we compute the score like this, but we make the values of these um, embedding vectors parameters. So we don't have this sort of uh, semantic annotation. We don't know what each of these k features are going to mean. They're just open. They are there to be learned. But if purely by the assumption that the score indicates how much a user will like something, we will learn features. And as we will see later, those features actually, it will turn out that those features map to, to a semantic concept. But that's sort of more uh, an emergent property. Uh, yeah, so this is how you can think of ideally what these uh, what these vectors would uh, would uh, end up meaning. Uh, and if you zoom back out to the matrix view, so here we have two embedding vectors making a score together. If you look at the whole matrix of all embedding vectors for movies, and the whole matrix of all embeddings for uh, embedding of all embedding vectors for users. All of their dot products together make this matrix product between these two, between the movie matrix and the user matrix. And this matrix product is a matrix of all of our uh, predicted ratings in this sort of scale between negative infinity and positive infinity. So the element Rij of this big matrix that we get by multiplying the movie and the user matrix is our predicted rating for movie i. Uh, sorry, uh, user i and movie j. And this is why we call this matrix factorization, because looking at it the other way around, we basically we have this matrix, this rating matrix, we are given this, our data set, our rating matrix, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to decompose it as the product of two low-rank matrices, one representing the users and one representing the uh, movies. That's why it's called matrix factorization. Because uh, these are factors, it's a multiplication, the elements of a multiplication are called factors. So we're factorizing the data. So now we have an optimization problem. We need to choose u and m, all the values of these entire matrices u and m, such that their product is approximately equal to the rating matrix that we've been given. And the standard way to think about this is with the squared error. So we just look at the difference between the two. We subtract these multiplied low rank matrices from the uh, ratings that we know to be true. And we take the squared error. So this is... Uh, what's called the Frobenius norm, which is a very complicated sounding term, but it's nothing more than the vector norm uh, as a matrix. So this is just uh, the squared errors, basically um, R minus UTM are all the errors, and we square all of them and then sum them up. That's what this says. So it's just the squared errors, errors minimization, but over this matrix. Uh, so it looks like this. Over all elements i and j of the matrix, we take this difference, we square it, and we sum it over all these elements. And then we want to find u 
uh, UNM, the UNM that minimizes. So in the vector view, it looks like this. We sum over all users i and movies j, and the dot product of the embedding for user i and for movie j, subtracted from the actual rating, uh, squared, that's our error. And we want to minimize, uh, oh, sorry, the equal signs are a bit wonky here. This, we, there should be an argmin in front of this thing. But this is the thing that we want to minimize. Uh, one problem to take into consideration in some settings that is usually we have a lot of missing values. So this matrix actually looks like this. So usually we set the missing values to zero, but these are not actually zero values. They are missing values, the values for which we don't know the value. Uh, so practically, in some, sen uh, some settings, it's more uh, accurate not to sum over the whole matrix, but to sum over only some elements of the matrix for which you know the rating. So the uh, objective stays the same, but the sum is now only over those elements for which we know the value. And that tends to lead to more accurate results. So now the question, how do we find U and M such that they minimize this error uh, function, this loss function? Uh, there are two options. One is alternating optimization, one is gradient descent. Uh, we'll look at alternating optimization very briefly. So we saw this before in expectation maximization and in k-means. Alternating optimization where your solution has two aspects. You fix one aspect and then you optimize with respect to that fixed uh, aspect and then you flip it around. And then you optimize the other with respect uh, to the first. So what we have here, we have this U matrix and this M matrix and this multiplication that should hold. So R should be equal to UTM. Um, so this is kind of like one equation with two unknowns. Uh, so if we have one equation with one unknown, we can solve it easily. It becomes an a ordinary least squares problem. Uh, so if we were to fix the user matrix, then it's very easy to optimize the movie matrix and vice versa. Uh, it becomes a linear problem, so we can do it optimally very quickly. So we can alternate these two steps. We can fix M, compute the new U, fix U, compute the new M, and then loop until we converge. Uh, this has some computational advantages over gradient descent, the second option, uh, and some disadvantages in terms of flexibility, so we won't go into it any further, but this is in some cases very easy to scale up. But we'll look with more detail at the gradient descent um, view of things. Um, which is more straightforward. We have an error function, we can compute the gradient. Uh, so we'll have a little, uh, a quick look at what those gradients are. You know how gradient descent looks. Uh, but we'll have a quick look at what those gradients are to get an indication of what happens to these embeddings as we learn how they are updated. Um, so we'll start here. We have a top left, basically the loss function we want to compute the, the gradient of the loss with respect to one of these parameters, and we'll start with the parameter UKL, which is for user L, the value of feature K. That's the one we're going to update, for which we're going to compute the gradient. Uh, so we fill in the uh, definition of the loss. We work out the sum. Uh, and then we define this matrix here, E, which is just the... Um, the value of the of all non-squared errors, of all the errors. Uh, so for all elements in our matrix, uh, in our rating matrix, we subtract the predicted rating, and that gives us a matrix E, which will simplify our notation. And then the loss is just the sum over those elements of E uh, that we're interested in, either all elements or the known elements, depending on how we're doing this optimization. Uh, and we want the derivative of the square of that value because we're doing squared errors with respect to this parameter that we're interested in. So we work this square out using the chain rule. Uh, the KL are the indices of the matrix. So uh, if you look at here at the bottom, uh, we want item KL of matrix U, 
which is this element here. So that's the kth feature for user L. So that's uh, so we're working out the gradient with respect to just one parameter. So we work this e out, uh, this um, square out using the chain rule, which we've seen a couple of times before. So we get one uh, factor e here, and then a derivative of the regular error here over the parameter we're interested in. So if we look at just these indices, we get uh, rij minus this dot product, the dot product of the um, user i times the embedding for movie j. So this is our, our predicted rating here. Uh, the rij disappears, because that's just a constant, that's given data. We, doesn't affect the, affect the gradient, the minus goes out in front. Uh, and this term, uh, the only uh, i for which this term is non-zero is when i is equal to k. So i disappears from the indexing, and we only look at this value here for uh, user k. Uh, sorry, user L. So I is equal to L. So now we have uh, almost have a gradient uh, because the uh, UKL, so uh, this dot product is also some for which only one term is non-zero. And for that term, uh, that's UKL times MKJ, where the UKL disappears because we're taking the derivative, so we end up with just MKJ. <coughs> MKJ. So this value here is our derivative. Now the question is, what does that mean? If we do gradient descent with this derivative, what do we get? So we take this derivative. Uh, we can rewrite this as a dot product. Note that this is a dot product between a row, no, sorry, between a column of E and a column of M. a row of m, sorry, column of e and a row of m. Uh, so we write that as a dot product, and we can apply gradient descent. So gradient descent tells us this is the update rule. We take the old UKL and we add to it uh, this value here, or we subtract to it this value here, from it this value here, so that turns in, this minus turns into a plus, scaled by eta, eta which is the learning rate, uh, and that becomes our new value of UKL. So that's how we update this UKL by the by gradient descent. Which means that what we're doing is uh, to compute the new value for UKL. We take all the ratings, uh, sorry, all the, the values that all the movies have for feature K. This is sort of indication of what feature K means. We take the dot product with all the errors for user L, how uh, wrong we were over all the movies, over all the different movies for this particular user, and the dot product of those two is how we update the feature K for the movie, for the user, sorry. Uh, and the same uh, for the uh, Updating the movies, the other way around, it all works out exactly the same. So there, to update the movies, we look at the current user ratings and the current errors over the particular movie, and we use that to update. So that's the basic principle of matrix factorization, how to do matrix factorization by gradient descent and how gradient descent operates uh, when you uh, train this matrix factorization model. Now we have to look at um, some ways to extend this uh, this problem, things that are uh, wrong with it, and uh, uh, now fitting in all these other sources of information. First thing to start with is that sometimes you don't have negative ratings. For instance, if you oh yeah, go ahead. Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> 
Uh, we'll look at that later in a bit more detail. But uh, so the question is: Is the what happens when a user pushes the like button? Is the gradient updated on the fly? Uh, no. So we imagine this for a frozen data set, and the model is basically you should imagine the model is retrained every two weeks or something like that. Uh, it's for all movies and all users in one go. That's how we do the matrix uh, factorization. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, what we see here is, is what I've described now is sort of training. So training is used to create these user movie matrices. Uh, then once we've trained, we take these matrices into production. And then when we want to generate a recommendation for a particular movie in a particular, so a particular movie logs in and we want to recommend uh, movies. Uh, for a particular user in a particular movie, we then compute the dot product for the uh, embeddings that we've trained. So then there's no gradient descent anymore. We just have a user embedding. We have a movie embedding. We take the dot product. And for instance, we can rank all our movies by that dot product and recommend the top movies, something like that. Ah, uh, that's we'll talk about that later. That's coming up. Um, so the first problem we'll deal with is the problem that sometimes you only have positive ratings. For instance, Facebook only asks people when they like something. Twitter only asks people when they like something, never when they dislike something. Which from user experience perspective is much better. You get much more data because the action is much more simple. Uh, people don't have to engage negatively. But it makes the data science problem a little bit more tricky because uh, there's a very easy solution to the problem now, which is just to say that everybody likes everything. And then you fit your data perfectly because that's only the only thing you know. So you need to deal with that. Uh, which is sort of common pro quite a common problem in, in machine learning where you have only positive examples to learn from. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to attack this. The most um, flexible and effective way in matrix recommendation is probably to sample negative examples. So basically what you need is examples of when people don't like something. Uh, basically what you do is you sample a random user and a random movie. You assume that the true likes are sparse, so there are uh, uh, a user is uh, much less likely to like get a random movie than to uh, uh, much less li uh, yes sorry is much more likely to dislike a random movie than to like it um, by a great extent. So that if you sample a random user movie pair, they will dislike it, and then you just feed those randomly sampled combinations to your uh, training system as negative examples. And then all you're doing, instead of trying to um, fit the actual ratings precisely, all you're doing is you want to maximize this um, dot product for the positive examples. It should go as high as possible. And for the negative examples, it should go as low as possible. So you can give it infinite, infinity and minus infinity as a target, but that's tricky. So what you can do instead is feed your dot product through a sigmoid, like this, and say that the positive example should, uh, uh, should map to 1, and the negative example should map to 0. And what you see is that uh, before the sigmoid, the positives are pushed towards infinity, and the negatives are pushed towards negative infinity. So this is basically logistic regression applied to matrix factorization. So then you train. And like I said, you uh, end up, by sort of the magic of machine learning, with act often with semantically meaningful uh, factors, uh, features. They're called factors in this diagram, but uh, we call them features in the lecture. So here are the first two features for basic matrix factorization on the Netflix data set. And what you see, let me see how it's laid out. So you see on the right here, Sophie's Choice, Citizen Kane, Annie Hall, so the very worthy sort of art house movies. And on the left, there's Freddy versus Jason, half-baked road trip, that sort of um, 
low uh, uh, low uh, rent popcorn fare with sort of more quirky art housey stuff in the middle here. A uh, bit of Tarantino, uh, Royal Tenenbaums, and at the bottom more mainstream uh, blockbuster stuff and some uh, some romance in there as well. So it's a bit mixed up, but it's very clearly laid out into uh, into semantic uh, semantically similar movies clustered together. And this is purely from the user likes. So there's no information in the data set about what actually is in the movie, who made it, what it contains, just what kind of people like it. Uh, so then there's a bunch of improvements that we can make. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, the, it looks like a long uh, thing, but it, it will, won't take very long, so we'll just plow through this and then have a break. Um, so these are five improvements that we can make. Control for certain aspects and add these extra sources of information. Uh, the first is user bias. Some users just happen to like movies more, or interp uh, users interpret this five-point scale in different ways. So in the Netflix uh, data set, it was always a five-point scale, uh, as opposed to what they have now, which is th thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, users interpret this in different ways. Some users have their mean at three. Some users have their mean very low. Um, and it can help a lot to uh, model this explicitly. So for a user to give them, to model their bias explicitly, to set their mean explicitly, so that when we're modeling their um, preference for a particular movie, instead of modeling the absolute value, we can model their distance to their mean value, to their personal mean, which sort of takes the pressure off modeling by this, uh, purely by this dot product. The same happens for movies. There are some movies that everybody likes, Shawshank Redemption, and there's some movies that nobody likes. Uh, so you have a movie, movie bias as well, and it happens to model that movie bias explicitly, independently of the user, so that when you bring in the user, you only have to model the distance to the, uh, the average amount of like for the movie. So this is dealt with very simply. You just include a one scalar term per user and per movie, and that's the sort of uh, mean likes this is a learned value, but it will express the mean, come to express the sort of mean likes for the user uh, and for the movie. And then this term here that expresses the particular like for the, uh, pr how, how much this particular uh, combination is liked by the user um, only m needs to model the difference to these two terms. And then you can add even one a uh, single scalar to sort of express the whole data set, how, uh, how much a user in general over the whole data set is, is uh, likely to like a movie. Uh, so this improves things a lot. Then there's the gold start problem, which is uh, what we uh, talked about earlier. So if a, a movie is newly added to the system or a user is newly added to the system, we don't have any likes for it for, or for them. So if somebody joins Netflix, what do we rec recommend them? Well, actually, if you join Netflix, they tell you to like a bunch of movies or to tell you which movies you like. Uh, but assume that doesn't happen or a user refuses to do that. Um, so, step one, we can use these implicit feedback, implicit likes. So look at what uh, movies they've browsed. Uh, movies they watched but didn't rate. That sort of thing. So let's start there, implicit feedback. Uh, what we do is we add a second user embedding for the implicit feedback. Because we, this means something, if something different, browsing a movie versus uh, liking a movie. So we'll add it to a different embedding. So we add a different embedding vector, u imp. And uh, for now, we'll keep things simple. And we'll just look at movies that the user has looked at instead of liked, for instance. And we'll get implicit feedback from that. So what we do is we create embeddings for those movies as well. So that's an, a movie embedding matrix X. 
uh, which is different from the actual movie embeddings we've used so far. And then we, to get a new uh, user embedding based on these implicit likes, we sum up all the new movie embeddings that the user has implicitly liked. And that's our, uh, uh, that's a vector that we add to the existing user embedding. So that can sort of, these new movie embeddings can sort of be trained to slightly uh, push our user embeddings in one direction or another direction. And then for side information, we can do the same thing. So we'll stick with very simple side information for now and we'll look at binary features, binary attributes, so things that either apply to a user or don't apply to a user. We'll express that with AU. AU is true, evaluates as true if, so, if that attribute applies to a user or false if it doesn't. So the user is European, for instance, or older than 40. And then for all of these attributes, we again learn an embedding vector just like we did for the movies, uh, which has a new width uh, based on the number of features. And then we learn an, another user embedding based on the side information, uh, which uh, we, where we sum, uh, which is created by summing up all the embeddings for all of these features which are also, again, learned. And then again, we add that to the uh, user embedding. So we have a user embedding based on their likes, based on their implicit likes, and based on their site information. We add them all together, and then we take the dot product, and then we learn the whole thing. So finally, final thing we need to account for uh, is time. If you look at the ratings over the data set, when they were made in time, what you see is this big jump here. And that's not some magical thing where users suddenly became more positive. What happened there is that the uh, Netflix changed the label they put on the lowest star. And they changed it from, let me say it properly, I didn't like it, to I hated it. And because people are less likely to, hate, to indicate that they hate something, the rating suddenly became much more positive. But they still sort of meant the same thing, so you need to account for this, ideally, in a good system. Uh, similarly, the age of a movie matters. Uh, not because old movies were better. So this is the uh, age since a movie came out, plotted versus the uh, average like. So older movies are liked more. It's just that newer movies are marketed more uniformly. So if a movie is new, then everybody's likely to encounter it. Whereas if a movie is very old, then only the people who know about the movie seek it out. So that gets a, uh, indicates this sort of bias. So again, if you model this kind of trend, then you take the weight of these dot products, and the, thing, the only thing the dot products have to model is the distance to the trend. So we want to give the model some way to model this trend explicitly, uh, which we do by making the vectors a function, of certain vectors, a function of time. So the user embeddings are now a function of time. Uh, user bias as well, user might get more positive over time. And the movie bias, the movie embedding is not a function over time because the movie, the properties of the movie stay the same. But the movie bias is a function over time because as it gets older, there becomes this, this selection bias uh, comes into effect. This sounds very fancy. Basically, the way to achieve this is to just chunk the data set into very large discrete chunks of time, for instance, three discrete chunks of time, and you, then you learn different embeddings for every chunk of time. You want to sort of find a trade-off between chunking this into such a small time that you don't have a lot of data for that time slot, and uh, such big slots that you, don't, you can't accurately model these trends over time. Uh, so that's sort of a straightforward way to, to include uh, time, to make these things a uh, uh, function of time. So to wrap up, recommender systems, if you are faced with two sets of entities that are linked somehow, about which you don't know very many 
useful things, and the links express the most interesting things you know. Then think about recommender systems and matrix factorization. Um, and then think about all these biases, regularizers, explicit likes, side informations, and temporal dynamics in order to improve your model. Uh, and here is the different impacts that the different, uh, different features have. And at the end, you end up about here, which is, I think this paper came out just before they actually managed to win the Netflix prize and take the money. But that point was around somewhere here. Yeah. Right, apologies for putting the break so late. Let's take 15 minutes and then talk about principal component analysis. So, uh, we talked at some length about this matrix factorization thing, where the idea was, even though ultimately we solved this mostly with gradient descent and, and on subsamples of these matrices, practically the thing that we're looking for is, given a matrix that represents our data, we want to break it up into these smaller low rank. We want to describe it as the product of these smaller low rank, low rank matrices. Um, this setting was slightly different from the um, from the uh, traditional setting where we had separate instances and features, uh, because we kind of have in our data matrix here R, we have instances in two directions. So we have users as instances, and we can think of all the likes they give to all the movies as the features representing that user. So we represent the user by all the things they've liked and every movie is a feature. So in this sense, it's a tra traditional data matrix. But we also have movies as kind of instances. And the features representing that movie are the, uh, the users by which they are liked. So in some sense, it's different from the traditional setting. Um, but in another sense, it's sort of similar. So the first thing we're going to look at now is what happens if we do the same trick to a traditional data matrix. So if we have a traditional uh, setting, machine learning setting, we have a data matrix, every row is an instance, every column is a feature. Um, we'll assume, to make things easier, that x is mean subtracted. So we, uh, if we have a normal data matrix, we compute the mean and we subtract the mean from every instance. Uh, what happens if we do the same decomposition trick on a matrix like this. So we're essentially learning a set of embeddings, low rank embeddings, W, for every in to represent every instance. And we're learning a set of low rank embeddings, C, to represent every feature. And if we multiply these two embeddings back together, we get a reconstruction of the data. Uh, which we want to optimize. So we want to learn these values to be uh, uh, to make W times CT as close to X as possible. So this is very close to the principal component analysis we saw earlier, where we had this, uh, in the one-dimensional case, one a kind of one uh, one number representing each instance. So that's sort of if you let k the number of feature the number of uh, 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 implicit features here, the number of sort of features of w go to one. So if this becomes one big factor, and this becomes one big uh, factor, then you get this sort of setting where you uh, represent every instance by one number. And what we saw then is that the uh, numbers. Uh, the, which, uh, sorry, representing every instance by one number, which means projecting them onto a line. What we saw then is that if we choose that line to be the line like this, that either minimize, that maximizes the variance when the points are projected onto the line, that's also the line that minimizes the reconstruction error, the squared reconstruction error. And then we so we uh, describe PCA as this sort of iterative approach, where given the first principal component, we can compute the second principal component, and so on. 
Um, so with two components, you get two uh, vectors, uh, two numbers representing uh, each instance, so two numbers in this orange matrix and two corresponding numbers in this uh, blue matrix. Uh, so we can think of PCA as a kind of matrix um, factorization where this row of W is a representation, the ith row of W is a representation of instance I. It's a uh, kth feature here indicates for this particular principal component how much of that principal component we should add. So every row in this uh, C matrix, or column in this matrix, I should say, because the, what we see here is the transpose matrix. But every row in this matrix that we're looking at here is a principal component. Uh, and the representation of the instance here is just a weighted sum of the principal components. So we multiply all these principal components by the values in this representation here. We sum them all up. And then we get a reconstruction of x that is, if we've done well, very close to the real value of x. Uh, now, this is if we do this like matrix factorization, then we have completely unrelated, then we're completely free to train the blue and the orange matrix, like we did with the users of movies. That's not how PCA works. PCA has some extra assumptions, namely that all uh, that the principal components, if you take them together, they are orthogonal to each other. So every principal component has an angle of 90 degrees to every other principal component. So together, they uh, span up a, uh, a system of axes, basically, a, a, a basis or a, a, a coordinate system. You can think of it as an in this coordinate system, the data is normally distributed, um, which you can express in linear algebra terms as saying that C times its transpose is equal to the identity function. If you have that, then you know that all the um, columns of C are linearly independent, uh, so they're orthogonal to each other. And because we know this, we can rewrite W uh, into this. So we now know that W is, uh, how does this work? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, not because of this, but we can rewrite W in terms of C. Uh, so we know that W times C should be as close as possible to X. Or in this case, um, well, let's put it differently. We know that W times CT is our reconstruction of the data, and we'll call that X. Um, and because of this linear independence, we can move ct to the other side and it becomes c so we can rewrite w in terms of this reconstruction in terms of c which allows us to get rid of w as a parameter so now c is the only parameter we have we're just learning the value of c so we're learning some linear independent linearly independent matrix and we reconstruct the data uh, we construct our embeddings for the data by multiplying x times c So in other words, this matrix decomposition objective that we had, this uh, norm over the uh, actual data minus the reconstructed data, uh, we fill in this idea of C, uh, this uh, um, rewriting of W that we had. We end up with this. And we want to choose C so that this value is minimized. So now we have a constrained optimization problem uh, where the normal matrix, matrix factorization was not constrained. This one is constrained. Uh, and uh, I think I promised in the earlier, the earlier PCA lecture, the fourth lecture, 
that we would actually talk about eigen decompositions and eigenvalues here, uh, but I couldn't really fit it in time-wise, so we'll have to skip that. But basically, if you want to compute this efficiently, there are various decompositions that you can use, such as the eigen decomposition or more numerically stable, the singular value decomposition. Um, yeah, you'll have to look back at your linear algebra uh, course to see what that, uh, if you want to know what that means and how it works. But as we've seen, you can also solve this problem because it's a matrix factorization problem. You can also solve it by gradient descent or alternating least squares. Why would you want to? Because singular value decomposition is much more efficient and much more uh, uh, numerically stable. Uh, the reason you might want to is that you can then fiddle with this loss function. For instance, what we saw with the matrix factorization is that our data matrix was highly incomplete, right? This matrix of all the ratings was extremely incomplete. There were lots of missing ratings there. Normally, that's not true in the classical setting. Normally, our data matrix is pretty much complete or has only very few missing values. But if it does have missing values, we can apply the same trick. So we can do incomplete principal component analysis, where we compute this reconstruction error, but we sum only over the known values. So it becomes much more like matrix factorization. And then we're doing dimensionality reduction and data completion, imputation, at the same time. Because when we reconstruct our matrix, we get a complete matrix. So basically this... Uh, predicting likes that we did earlier, we can think of that as imputation. We can think of that as filling in our missing values. So if we do uh, incomplete PCA and look at our reconstructions, we can take that as good guesses for our missing values. This is much trickier, and you can solve it by uh, singular value decomposition, but with this matrix factorization and gradient descent, you can solve it. Another thing you can do is add regularizers. So you can force these embeddings to be simple in some sense, where simplicity is defined by what regularizer you use. So you can use an L2 regularizer on, the, uh, uh, on your embeddings. You can do this. I skipped this for the, in the first part, but you can do this on your uh, matrix factorization method as well. Uh, we're adding the square of the norm here instead of just the norm. Earlier, when we talked about regularizers, we added the norm. That doesn't really matter very much. Uh, but basically, what you're doing is you're forcing the embeddings to stay close to the origin, to stay close to zero. You're looking for small values to combat overfitting, basically. Uh, that's a good question. Does it matter how the uh, missing values are distributed when you're doing incomplete PCA or incomplete matrix factorization? Um, so I guess you have a problem if for one instance or for one feature you have only missing values. That's like the cold start problem. Um, otherwise, well, yeah, I'd say it's, it's bad if you have more missing values features, uh, more mis missing values, uh, just in general. So if all your missing values are in one column, that's a problem. You'd much rather have them uh, more uniformly distributed. Um, otherwise, off the top of my head, I can't think of a specific... Uh, yeah, I ideally, you just want them to be more uniformly distributed. It's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. Um, what you can also do is add one of these L1 regularizers, which, if you remember, uh, does the same thing, forces your values to be closer to zero, but also forces your values to be exactly zero. So it differentiates between something. Uh, it it uh, has a much stronger preference, this L1 regularizer. So look back at the deep learning lecture if you've uh, forgotten about this. But it has a much stronger preference for values that are exactly zero than for values that are almost zero. So what you get if you do this is a kind of sparse PCA where these embedding values uh, end, up being, uh, end up being 
zero if they're almost uh, zero. So you get much more axis aligned um, representations. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to see, but here you have a normal PCA on the left and a sparse PCA on the right. And apparently these in the sparse PCA, the, um, the, uh, the principal components are much more aligned to the, uh, or the, sorry, the reconstructions are much more aligned to the planes of the axis, are much more sort of uh, orthogonal. Uh, but it's not the best plot to actually see this. And you can apply any, all the other tricks that we know for matrix factorization, you can apply to PCA, such as if you have only positive data, you can do non-negative PCA. And if you have only binary data, you can do logistic PCA. So in all these settings, you almost always lose the analytical solution that the classical PCA gives us. So you can't solve it analytically anymore by uh, singular value decomposition. But you get all these other nice properties that you can play with. So that's PCA. Then to graph models, like I said, we'll do very high overview of, of how to model graphs. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that you can now immediately do this, but it's more to sort of give you the message that there is a field out there called uh, graph models. And if you do something like this for a, a project like your bachelor thesis, uh, this might be a good place to start. Uh, to start. Uh, so there are a lot of graphs in the world, social graphs, how people interact. Uh, how proteins interact within your cells, within your bodies. Traffic networks, how traffic flows through the, through the Netherlands. Knowledge graphs, uh, so for instance, relations between uh, people and institutions, who is hired by whom, who works for whom. Uh, that sort of thing can be expressed in a, in a knowledge graph. And all these graphs um, yeah, express a lot of infor important information. So the question is, how do we do machine learning on them? How do we build a model such that we can feed a graph to it, basically. There's lots of different ways and lots of uh, things to consider, uh, but we'll look at it purely from a perspective now where it's very similar to this matrix factorization perspective. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we'll look at two tasks, sorry. So we'll look at two tasks on graphs. Uh, the first is link prediction which is very similar to uh, recommendations. So for instance, if all of these people are uh, users that can follow each other on a social network, and then you're predicting whether or not uh, two users sh should have a link between each other, then you're basically doing recommendation. Uh, so this is very similar to recommendation. So we assume that the graph is incomplete, that we don't know all the links in the graph, or all the links that there should be in the graph, and we predict uh, between two nodes whether there should be a link. So if you just apply the matrix factorization view as is, you get this. You're basically learning node embeddings. So embedding factors for the nodes. Uh, so you do matrix factorization with the same embedding matrix on both sides. And the, uh, the rating, what was previously the rating matrix, our, our data is now a square matrix because we have the same number of things on both sides. And that's, based, that's our adjacency matrix. If you don't know your graph theory or you don't quite remember your graph theory, the adjacency matrix is the matrix that um, has all the, uh, lists all the nodes on the rows and all the nodes on the columns and has a one if there's a link between that particular node and that particular uh, other node. Um, that's called the adjacency matrix. And it basically just describes the structure of the graph. Uh, we'll come back to, to how to do this more, uh, <clears throat> how to extend this, uh, this idea. But there's another task that's interesting, which is node classification. So with node classification, we assume that we are given a graph, but we are also given a set of labels for every um, node in the graph. In this case, binary labels, positive and negative, red and blue. And we want to predict for particular nodes for which we don't have the labels, 
we want to predict the, la the labels. <clears throat> this is very useful if, for instance, the labels are similar within the graph. So in a social graph, for instance, if you want to predict um, what party, in a two-party system like America, what party a person is going to vote for, you will see that the Republicans and the Democrats cl are clustered together in the graph. So even if you, if you have no information about people, if you just look at how their friends vote, you can predict that very easily. Uh, that's a very good predictor, so then this kind of model would be very helpful. Ah, good question. Are the graphs always undirected? No. Uh, can be directed, can be undirected. Uh, I've drawn it uh, undirected here, but uh, both are possible. Uh, could, they could have self-loops, they could have multiple edges sometimes, they could have edges with different relations on them. Uh, that's all possible. Um, so we'll look at exactly how to do node classification later. Uh, but for now, um, but first uh, we need to look at the principle of mixing node embeddings. So we have these node embeddings. And based on these node embeddings we can do link prediction already, because that's basically a recommendation. Uh, but we cannot, based on the node embeddings, if this is a big matrix of node embeddings, we cannot do uh, label prediction because that would just lead to overfitting. If we just train a basic classifier on this and train the embeddings based on these labels, um, we would perfectly store the target label in the embeddings, but it wouldn't generalize to a, a validation set because we're not learning things uh, for the, we're not learning anything about uh, nodes that, for which we don't have a label yet. Uh, so if we apply it like this naively, we just learn the embeddings directly based on the labels that we have. We are just learning sort of a perfectly overfitting classifier. We need to transfer this information somehow to the nodes for which we don't have labels yet. And in order to do that, we will mix the node embeddings. So to give you a sort of high level analogous view of what this looks like, imagine you have uh, node embeddings with uh, k is three, so three features per node, three values embedding values per node, um, let's say between zero and one. We, so we, interpret, we can interpret those as colors, just to make it easier to plot, RGB values. And if we initialize randomly, uh, or we train without looking at the neighbors, each node gets its own color. And neighboring node, the colors of neighboring nodes have nothing to do with each other, because they're just sort of, uh, we're not looking at the graph structure yet. And what we can then do is we can mix these colors slightly based on the neighbors. So every we update the color of the node by uh, broadly keeping it the same, but mixing in slightly the values of the neighboring uh, nodes, the colors of the neighboring nodes. And what you see is that step by step, uh, even after one step already, the nodes start slightly clustering so that one neighborhood in the graph broadly gets the same color. So because there's a bunch of purple up top here, these become broadly purple and these become broadly green nodes. Uh, so you're sort of mixing together information about the node's identity, which we see here on the left, where each node has a, an explicit identity, has its own color. And the only thing you can tell from the color is whether nodes are different or the same node and you're slowly mixing in information about the graph neighborhood so that the color tells you not just about, uh, tells you not just which node you're looking at, but also which part of the graph you're looking at. And if you keep doing that, eventually you end up with purely gray nodes, or white nodes, or black nodes, depending on exactly how you mix this. So essentially you get a kind of spectrum. Here every node, here the color indicates only the identity of the node, and here the color indicates only something about the entire structure of the graph, but no longer anything about the identity of the node. And somewhere in between is where we want to be, where the color, which is, remember, represents the embedding that we have for the node, represents information both about the identity of the node and the, the graph structure. And if we have that, sort of this little bit of mixing, then we can look at the embedding and get information from the rest of the graph based on the embedding. 
So how do we implement this mixing? What does this mixing mean in practice? Uh, basically, it, uh, it means looking at all the embeddings of all the neighbors and your own embedding, summing them all up, and uh, averaging them. If you sum them all up, if you just sum them all up, the values just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you don't want that. Uh, so what you do is you sum them all up, and then you divide by the number of nodes you've seen, which is equivalent to multiplying by the adjacency matrix uh, with ones on the diagonal. So for this graph, the adjacency matrix here has the black elements as ones. That's the point where there are links. Uh, and basically, we add self loops, so we connect every node to itself so that we don't lose that embedding by uh, summing the adjacency matrix with the identity matrix. So we just fill in the, uh, the diagonal values as well. And then what we see if we um, uh, take these um, node embeddings, this matrix of node embeddings, and we multiply it by this adjacency matrix, or we multiply the adjacency matrix by the node embeddings, then what comes out is a new matrix of node embeddings, where every node embedding, uh, so here what we see is the first node embedding is the sum of its original node embedding with the two nodes that are its neighbors. So if we multiply by the adjacency matrix, but we normalize the adjacency matrix, so if we do this multiplication, then the values in this new matrix are three times as big as the values in the old matrix. So we want to avoid that blow up. So what we can do is we can row normalize the adjacency matrix. So instead of putting ones on these values here, we divide by the row wise sum. So this in the first row here, it becomes the values become one third, one third, one third. And in the third row here, the values become one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. So that the magnitude of the new embeddings is roughly the same as the magnitude of, as of the old embeddings. And this is how we can do this um, gentle mixing of embeddings by multiplying by the adjacency matrix, uh, which is row normalized. Uh, row normalization like this, like I've just described here, works for most graphs. There's a slightly better way of doing it, which only works for undirected graphs, which is called symmetric normalization. Uh, I won't go into that. It works slightly better. It looks slightly more complex. So using this mixing, we can describe what is called a graph convolution, where A is this uh, normalized, uh, normalized adjacency matrix. So you start with some node embeddings, initialized randomly, which we are going to learn. You mix the node embeddings by multiplying it by this normalized adjacency matrix. And then you multiply by a weight matrix which does two things. It uh, can transform the size of this hidden dimension and it uh, sort of, uh, yeah, it, 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 well, it basically it gives you some weights to slightly manipulate these embeddings. Uh, so from one set of embeddings N0 to a new set of embeddings N1, this function here, multiplying by this normalized adjacency matrix, multiplying by some weights, and applying some activation, sigmoid, ReLU, or linear activation, uh, gives you a new set of node embeddings, and that's called a graph convolution. And you can do that multiple times to give you multiple sorts of layers, or things that are similar to the layers in a normal neural network. Uh, usually more than two layers doesn't really make sense, so usually you don't do only two graph convolutions. Uh, which then looks like this. Here we have sigmoid activation, that could be anything, which gives you a bunch of output embeddings for your nodes, or output representations for your nodes. And you can think of this as if you take, if you add two layers, um, you're sort of mixing in information from further and further away in the graph every uh, step. So if you have two layers, you are your final node embeddings O uh, contain not just the information about that node that you're looking at currently, but also all its neighbors and its neighbors of its neighbors. 
And then on top of those final embeddings, you can build a classifier. So that looks like this. We start with the normal graph here. We give them some no give each node a node embedding. We add a convolution, which mixes information in the neighbors with its own information. Get some new node embeddings, we apply sigmoid activation. We do another convolution, and then we tune this weight matrix so that it uh, projects down from our embedding size to the number of classes that we have. And then we apply, instead of a sigmoid activation, a softmax activation, so that these output embeddings are probabilities that sum to one, which we then take as class probabilities. So now we get a class uh, uh, probabilities over all our nodes, which we can compare to the classes we know to be true, for those nodes for which we have true classes. And then we just backpropagate. We implement this whole thing in a deep learning, in an automatic differentiation engine, and then we can just backpropagate this to learn the original node embeddings and the weights of the convolutions to give us a good uh, neural network over our graph. And if we want to do link prediction, we could already do, print, do link prediction pretty well, but we can now do link prediction with graph convolution by basically starting with some initial node embeddings, applying a bunch of graph convolutions, and then on what comes out, N3, we apply this link prediction uh, loss function, which we train by gradient descent, so we can back propagate the loss that we get here on our predictions uh, to these N3 matrices down the network to learn the weights of the graph convolution and the weights of the original embeddings. So we have a link prediction that uses not just the information about the nodes, but also the information about the, from the wider graph. So that's graph convolutional neural networks, which are, uh, can be a very useful method. Uh, so depth is a bit of a problem. Usually we can do only two layers and then uh, sort of the information diffuses too much and it stops helping. It's almost always full batch. So the whole data set goes in and we train on the whole data set in one go. There's not a really clear way of how to split your data set into many batches. So if you have a very big graph, then you need to think about how to uh, break this up. And it's important to know that this sort of pooling operation that pulls information from the nodes of the graph is uh, not selective in graph convolutions. So all neighbors are counted equally. The weights are, uh, the all neighbors are summed and then the weights are applied. So the weights have no influence over which neighbors are important and which neighbors are not important. If you want that, you need something called graph attention, which is more, uh, well, which we won't go into today. So that's graph models. Finally, a note on validation in these kinds of embedding models. So let's start with the matrix models that we talked about the most. Basically, the question is, how do you split your data set? How do you, if you want to withhold some data, some test data, and then later some validation data, how do you split? Do you withhold some users? If you do that, then you have a problem, because once you've trained on this matrix, you actually don't have any embedding for your test users. Do you withhold some movies? Well, then you have the same problem. You can train a bunch of movie embeddings and a bunch of user embeddings, but then when it comes to test time, you have no embeddings for these movies here. So that doesn't work either. Because we have these mixed features. The features for our users are the uh, features for our users are their ratings, and the feature features for the movies are the ratings they are given. So what we need to do, oh sorry, um, first more zoom out, uh, more general idea here that we see with all embedding methods um, is that there's a difference between inductive and transductive learning. So inductive learning is what we've done so far, where you have a data matrix with a bunch of features, a bunch of labels, and you split both sets. So you withhold both the features and the labels for your test set. That's called inductive learning. That's what we've been doing so far. In transductive learning, uh, it's basically the slightly, in, well, in classical machine learning, it's a slightly obscure setting where you actually are allowed to look at the features of your test set. And the only thing you withhold 
are the labels of your test set. In classical machine learning, this maybe allows you to fit slightly more accurate models to your test set. Uh, probability distributions, nobody really took this seriously in the classical setting until these embedding models were pop became popular. Because if you train embedding vectors for your, uh, if you train embedding vectors, then you need to have seen uh, the thing you train embedding vectors for during training. If you don't see these objects that you train your embedding vectors for during training, then you cannot test on them. So um, learning embedding models is always transactive. You always see all of your objects during training, and the only thing you withhold are their labels. So that's the same for word to vec for recommendation and for graph models. So for graph models, we need to see the whole graph. For recommendation, we need to know all users and all movies during training. And for word to vec which we saw last time, we need to know all the words before training. Which means, in recommendation, that you split your data set like this. So you need to make sure that all movies and all users are in the test set. So you sort of randomly split over your ratings. You randomize your ratings, and you split. You withhold some of your ratings and some of your uh, some of your ratings for test and some of your ratings for validation. So test is the blue ones, validation is the orange ones, and then what's left over are the green ones, which you can use to train on. In graphs, it depends on whether you're doing link prediction or node classification. So in link prediction, you withhold some of the links. It's basically this picture, but drawn as a graph. In node classification, you need to see the whole graph during training, as we saw. Uh, so what you usually do is you separate, uh, you uh, make a separate table where you map node ideas to labels. And there you do a classical split on this part of the table. So this split, this table you can split like a, into a test and training and validation set. But this part of your data, the whole graph, you need to see during training. <coughs> and finally, remember that if you have timestamps, you need to also consider your validation set in that respect. So you need to make sure that, if, for instance, your ratings are timestamped, which, which they usually are, uh, you split according to time. So you do not put ratings in your training set that are in the future. Uh, respective to your validation set or to your test set. So no, uh, uh, yeah, like it says here. So, final summary. Uh, there's this new abstract task of recommend recommendation systems for which matrix factorization is a good uh, way to view it, to model it. And matrix factorization can also be applied in different settings to give us a new view on PCA and to give us a good inspiration for how to deal with graphs. And this is a new abstract task, so you need to rethink how you need to deal how you deal with your validation set the data. So that's all for today, and I'll see you on Monday when we will talk about reinforcement learning.